Have you ever heard of the Talmud? Is it a commentary from the rabbis? Is it a bunch of Jewish law stuff? Tens of thousands of students around the world study this seemingly endless Aramaic encyclopedia. But why? And where did it come from? Let's say you could find all the answers to those perplexing and confusing moral questions in the Bible. Virtually any question you could think of is not only discussed, but meticulously argued within the Talmud. And its essential rulings aren't considered opinion, but the conclusions of the arguments are binding and codified by later legal texts. Before we go into the history of the Talmud, let me just tell you what the oral law is, as the two are very connected. According to the traditional understanding in Judaism, on Mount Sinai, God revealed the written Torah to Moses, aka the five books of Moses. But along with that, God gave a component body of knowledge to flesh out and fully explain that written Torah. The written Torah says to keep Shabbat, but nowhere does it really say how to do that. The component known as the Oral Torah explains all the ins and outs alluded to within the written Torah. But Torah was also meant to be intimately personal and almost malleable for each person, with the proper and full understanding, of course. In that way, the Torah is thought of as a living document. The Oral Component, a library of information that was memorized by the sages of ancient Israel and taught in a one-on-one -on -one manner from teacher to student or parent to child, made this possible. This is how the Torah was taught for over 1,500 years of faithful transmission. But with the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE, things changed dramatically, and there came a need for writing down some of this tradition, starting first with a work known as Mishnah, and then centuries later, the Talmud. When the Second Temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 CE, it was an unbearable disaster for every living Jew. Think 9-11, combined with the burning of the Library of Alexandria, times getting your identity stolen, while watching your childhood home get demolished by Hitler. I know that sounds extreme, but it was really that bad. Without the temple, everything about Jewish life was uprooted. The central government, the court system, and the religious authority. Though there was a community that remained in Israel, most had been exiled to places like Syria, Egypt, and most notably Babylon, think modern day Iraq. The point is, with all of that, plus continued persecutions in their new homes in exile, teaching the oral law in that one-on-one -on -one style became a whole lot more difficult. As we mentioned in our last video about the Mishnah, a rabbi named Judah Hanasi, aka Judah the Prince, understood that policy would need to change if Judaism was going to survive. He made an earth-shattering break with tradition and compiled the Mishnah, a collection of statements about Jewish law that detailed the essential components of the oral Torah over six books. But eventually, along with further persecution of the Jewish people, when Emperor Constantine adopted Christianity as the religion of the Roman Empire in 325 CE, even this Mishnaic system would need some support. Jump forward a couple hundred years, and a vast companion document to the Mishnah was created. The Talmud. Actually, two Talmuds. By the second half of the fourth century, the community in Israel, now known as Palestine, started to really suffer. The Roman Emperor Constantius' anti-Jewish edicts impeded Jewish economic growth, authorities prevented rabbis from meeting to carry out essential Jewish decisions, and Christians burning down synagogues was condoned, if not common. Clearly, if the oral tradition was to be kept intact, another innovation would be necessary. Multiple scholars elucidated the Mishnah. Rabbi Abba Arika, also known as Rav Abba Bar Ebo, but most simply known as Rav, compiled the Sifra and the Sifri, Rabbi Chia composed the Tosefta, and Rabbi Yoshaya and Bar Kapra composed the Baraisot. But around 365 CE, years after the fall of the Second Temple, Rabbi Yochanan began to compile the Jerusalem Talmud for the Mishnaic teachings. It wasn't really compiled in Jerusalem, but mostly in Tiberias, which is why many scholars call it the Palestinian Talmud instead. It is believed that Rabbi Mana and Rabbi Yossi ben Rabbi Bun wrote the final text of the work around a hundred years after Rabbi Yochanan died. Since the Mishnah had a cryptic nature that required a teacher's guidance for it to be fully understood, the rabbis of Israel would write down those explanations. But still trying to hold on to some semblance of oral quality, the rabbis wouldn't just write down their answers, but they also recorded meticulous discussions that looked at each question from all possible angles. The Talmud was compiled from these writings. Now, the Talmud doesn't read like the standard instruction manual, but a lively conversational transcript that talks about the Shabbat one minute, then jumps to mixing milk and meat the next. 
The biggest rabbis of that generation, known as the Amorayim, would argue back and forth, citing sources, Akkadic stories, which contain folklore, and esoteric mystical insights. Oh, and to top it all off, it's written in Jewish-Palestinian Aramaic, a difficult Western Aramaic dialect as well as Hebrew, and is actually designed as a bit of a logic puzzle, just to keep you on your toes. This explanation of the Mishnah is referred to as Gemara, literally completion. The Mishnah and the Gemara together are known as the Talmud. It was a daunting effort that was never fully completed. The major books we do have, Zerayim, Moed, Nashim, and Ezekin, all have significant portions missing. Two other books, Tehorod and Kodashim, have been lost completely. However, if at first your grand idea doesn't succeed, well, maybe someone else will finish it. Not long after, the same gargantuan task was undertaken by the Babylonian communities. While the conditions in Palestine became increasingly caustic for Jews living there, Babylon's Jewish communities, which had existed since the time of the destruction of the first temple in 586 BCE, started to flourish in Sura and Pumbedita around the later part of the second century. The cities of Nahardia, Nisibis, and Mahoza were almost completely populated by Jews. Jewish academies, or yeshivot as they are known today, were prominent, especially during the off-seasons when work slowed and thousands of Jews flocked to the academies. In a lot of ways, the center for Jewish life and thought had shifted out of Jerusalem and migrated to Babylon. When Rav Ashi became the new president of the academy in Surah, he began compiling what would come to be known as the Babylonian Talmud. Free from Roman and Christian persecution, the creators of the Babylonian version had time and space for more thorough explanations and editing. It's therefore more comprehensive. By the end of its compilation in the late 5th century, the Babylonian Talmud had accumulated over 300 years of rabbinic opinions on Mishnah from all the prominent Jewish academies throughout Babylon, which included 30 volumes, 5,900 pages in total. Codifying the majority of the oral tradition that Moses received at Sinai was no simple task. Ironically, its completion nearly coincides with the collapse of the Roman Empire in 476 CE, the very entity that necessitated its creation. The following generation of rabbis and scholars known as the Saburaim, or the Explainers, finally smoothed over teachings in the Babylonian Talmud, shaping its final formulation around 550 CE. As Jewish history progressed into even more difficult times with the Arab conquest of Israel in 651 and the continued rise of Christianity, the Babylonian Talmud gained authority over the Jerusalem version. The Babylonian Talmud was widely circulated within diaspora communities throughout the Middle Ages. It wasn't long before it was regarded as both the new backbone of Jewish learning and tradition and the essential guidepost for education and rulings for all decisions of Jewish law. Today, the Talmud is taught alongside the Torah in many traditional religious schools and yeshivas. But because of its expansiveness and difficulty, the Talmud takes far more work to comprehend and therefore requires more time to teach. The written Torah is considered the Word of God, and so is the Oral Torah. But the compilation of the Talmud was written by man in a specific historical period, so controversial opinions do show up. Remember, it's a series of arguments, not a unified manifesto. You might come across a difficult opinion, yet the very next sentence might be an argument from a rabbi about why that idea is wrong. So you can see how someone who takes an isolated opinion out of context might present a negative view of Judaism. And you can also see how those statements could give the church-driven anti-Semitic cultures of France and Italy an excuse to burn the handwritten manuscripts in the 13th and 14th centuries. The attempt to wipe out thousands of years of Jewish scholarship, though heartbreaking, were clearly not successful. Eventually, parts of the Talmud were censored to remove some touchy subjects that Christians might find disconcerting. Studying the Talmud is daunting, if not impenetrable, to the uninitiated. With no vowels, no punctuation, allusions and quotations from other sources, and switches from Hebrew to Aramaic on a dime, if you don't know what you're doing, it can be difficult to get a solid understanding of the surface ideas, let alone the deeper hidden meanings. So it's best studied in pairs. These learning partners are called chavrutas. Think your workout buddy, but for religious text. Studying with a scholar or rabbi really helps the process, too. The text is so deep and multi-layered that, unlike, say, an arithmetic book that's only studied by first graders compared to a textbook on advanced number theory that would only be read by grad students, a page of the Talmud could be studied or learned by a ten-year-old, while the most learned rabbi could study that same page and still uncover profound insights. If you studied one page of the Talmud a day, it would take you seven and a half years to finish. 
In fact, a movement called Daf Yomi was started in 1923 to do just that. Today, tens of thousands of Jews from every corner of the earth learn the same page of Talmud on a schedule, which culminates in a stadium-sized celebration at its completion, complete with a Where's Waldo appearance. Feeling a void in the Israeli education system, Israeli academic and politician Ruth Calderon discovered a profound connection to the Talmud. As she puts it, I was enamored with its humor, language, profound thinking, its modes of discussion, and the practicality, humanity, and maturity that emerged from its lines. I sensed that I had found the love of my life. In 1996, she founded Alma, the home for Hebrew culture in Tel Aviv, and Elul, the first joint Beit Medrash, Jewish study halls, for men and women and for religious and secular. This ushered in a Jewish Renaissance movement, with tens and hundreds of Israelis studying the Talmud. The Talmud is a comprehensive document that explores every aspect of Jewish thought and practice. But apart from the moral and religious content, the Talmud serves as a tremendous training tool for abstract reasoning, applying logic, recognizing distinctions, and viewing problems from multiple perspectives. As much as it immerses the reader in Jewish tenets, traditions, and thought, it also trains them to think in new and complex ways. The cliché of the Jewish lawyer may be a stereotype, but the fact is, many of the approaches of Talmudic learning are the very concepts covered in the first year of a case law class in law school. As many religious communities begin Talmudic study at 14 years of age, with Mishnah learning beginning at age 10, that's quite the head start for learning foundational legal concepts. Could Talmudic study be the secret to Jewish success? Who knows? But the people of South Korea seem to think so, leading to a recent craze that has made Talmudic study a popular educational tool for all ages. South Koreans have reached out to Torah academies, inquiring about their Talmudic curricula and visiting famous yeshivot in Israel, such as the Mir and Eshat Torah. Though they have little interest in following the religious tenets, engaging strictly as an intellectual exercise, it's pretty incredible that there are rooms full of South Korean teenagers learning about Shabbat and kosher. So, that's a Talmud the closest thing we have to capturing the expansive breadth of Jewish thought and identity. Born out of the threat of increasing and heart-shattering persecution, the extraordinary efforts of these transitional generations to preserve, codify, and adapt this sacred tradition may have been the singular reason for Jewish survival and success during their 2,000-year exile. It's certainly not easy to tackle. In recent years, Jewish publishers like Art Scroll and Koran have gone through the painstaking process of translating the entire Talmud into English and other languages, making it far more accessible. You might be able to find translations online as well. But even with the work of later generations and the translations, hundreds of students in Jewish academies around the world spend hours a day trying to crack open and master the deepest, most profound concepts that were given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you like what we're doing here, make sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell so you'll know first when we upload new videos.